something bad was about to happen and we didn't want to witness it. I heard my dad's last words. There were times where she would instigate and there were times he would hit her. We know that from looking back upon historic criminals, you have to be a pretty smart person to fully get away with murder. You have to plan ahead, think of every detail, and be fully prepared. It's a very challenging thing to accomplish, and if just one detail goes overlooked, you're pretty much done for. Imagine that detail you overlooked was forgetting to look for surveillance cameras and the entire murder was captured clearly for the police to see. That has been the case for some people. The following stories tell the tale of three heartless killers who were caught on CCTV cameras. We have a clean-cut family man who loved his kids turn into a heartless abuser. We have a young girl slaughtered and hidden inside a cooler used to store food. And finally, we have a man who was rejected by a woman and is desperate to get revenge, even by taking the life of an innocent bystander who did nothing to hurt him. It's a picture of domestic heaven, and Donald Mellon is your typical doting dad, a clean-cut family man his daughters loved and adored. But there's a lot behind a picture that people don't see. Donald's daughter, Darcy, can testify to the kind of person her father was. He always helped people without them asking for help. He really was a nice, caring guy. Donald owned a very successful McDonald's franchise in their hometown of Phoenix, Arizona. So he was able to give his wife Karen and three children a very nice life. They got to do a lot of things that other kids don't always get a chance to experience, like frequent road trips, visits to Disney World, and a trip to Hawaii. But despite what appeared to be completely domestic, there would be dark things to come in the future. Karen, his ex-wife, explained how things went down. Unfortunately, he turned to the alcohol and he just wasn't strong enough to give up the alcohol for his family. And with raising three kids, I couldn't do it anymore. After Karen divorced Donald, he completely changed. He went from a clean-cut father to someone totally different. Now single, Donald is ready to have some fun. And fun he had when he met a young, exotic dancer by the name of Rebecca Chiva. She was beautiful, wild, and down to have a good time. She spent her days stripping and drinking. She was not the type of person you would really expect to see Donald with. But when she met him, she knew one thing for sure. He had money and she wanted it. Donald is only too happy to start a new life with Rebecca. If he had any sense that his new partner was in it for the money, that didn't hold him back from taking things seriously with her. The pair ended up getting married, and he buys a new house for her to live in, along with her son, Thaddeus. My first thought was, wow, this lady's fun. According to Kita Adar, a friend of Rebecca and Donald, the parties this strange couple would throw were lots of fun. He was very charismatic, funny, one of the most amazing giving individuals I've ever met in my life. Rebecca was young, beautiful, feisty, fun. But Karen was a lot less impressed by her ex-husband's crazy, always partying new partner. She thought it was inappropriate. She showed my daughter a picture of her giving him all sex. She was taking them to go egg in houses and the amount of alcohol in the house, I, I knew that that was not any situation for any child to be in. The heavy partying isn't good for Donald either. He gets his new wife's name tattooed across his stomach and starts going by DJ, the name Rebecca gave him. The minute he met her, he turned into DJ, into something that I had no idea who he was anymore. Rebecca and Donald didn't just love alcohol. They also loved guns and stocked up on them. Meanwhile, their lifestyles were totally getting out of control, so much so that their own friends began to start worrying about them. Their breakfast was a big old bottle of Chardonnay. By lunchtime, they were drinking vodka mixed with something, doing shots, wine, all night long. And it seemed like they never slept or ate. On one hot July night, 
this couple's extreme partying and crazy lifestyle came to a tipping point, as can be heard on this 911 call. Phoenix 911, where's your emergency? Hello? Yeah, my husband is bleeding and I need a vehicle now. Rebecca is clearly under the influence during the phone call and doesn't seem to be that worried about finding help for Donald. She's speaking slowly and incoherently sometimes. And what's your husband doing? He's bleeding. Okay, what happened to him? I don't know. He's bleeding. The dispatcher stays patient but makes it clear that she can't offer the proper help if Rebecca doesn't start talking. I'm trying to figure out what's going on, ma'am. You're not really giving me any information. Why is okay, he Okay, he's going to die if you don't set an ambulance Okay, why is now. he bleeding? I don't know. Because Rebecca shows no urgency and takes so long to try to get help, by the time that EMS arrives at the couple's house, Donald is already too far gone, having suffered a gunshot to the head. He later dies at the hospital. When the police check out the scene and try to figure out what happened, they find a pistol that has been hidden between couch cushions. Rebecca is clearly drunk and says she doesn't know what happened to her husband. She is taken into the police station for questioning. I like drank like two drinks, he drank two drinks. I like came out of the room and then I was like, why are you like laying on the ground? Like, what are you doing? And then I was like, oh my God, like, like there was like blood coming out of his head. Okay. And I like, I called 911 like right away. As if it was not already incredibly tragic that Donald's children have now lost their father, he also left a message for them just before he was shot. The message had come through at 9.44 p.m. So we put the phone on speaker, and my dad said, Hey, call me. What the f You can then hear a popping sound and yelling. <laughs> and just to know, wow, I heard my dad's last words, you know. Darcy believed, without a shadow of a doubt, that Rebecca was behind her father's murder. She always believed that Rebecca was capable of such things. Luckily enough, there was a security camera in Donald and Rebecca's home that would reveal the truth. They rolled back the tape to 9.44 p.m., and what they saw was horrifying. She flipped out. She killed him. The video is far too graphic for police to share with the public but it essentially depicts Rebecca walking into the room while Donald is distracted, leaving a message for his daughter. She then points the gun at his head and shoots him. The bullet grazed his skull and then came out the other end and got lodged into a photo hanging on the wall that was taken of Rebecca on her wedding day. While Donald lies on the ground bleeding, Rebecca leaves the room and puts a t-shirt on that reads, Shooter's World. She then returned to where Donald was lying and shot him in the head. Unlike what she told police, Rebecca did not call 911 immediately. She sat on the couch for 23 minutes, smoked a cigarette leisurely while drunkenly considering what to do next. Those 23 minutes could have been the difference that saved Donald's life. That to me is what confirms she's evil. How do you not only do that to someone, but then sit? and let them die, watch them die. At first, this seems to be a clear-cut murder case between a wife and husband, but there was more than what meets the eye, as police would discover the further they looked into the case. Part of this would involve interviewing their friends. Kita actually lived with Donald and Rebecca for around a year, so she saw things other people didn't see. Kita looked back at some of the crazy parties they had and what they led to between the couple. It would be so calm and chill. And then somebody had too much to drink and Rebecca could be nagging and annoying and not know when to stop. Marcus Sadar, another one of the couple's friends, also lived with them for a time. Marcus saw plenty of outbursts between the two. Would he get upset? He would get upset. There were times where she would instigate. There were times he would hit her. 
Donald and Rebecca were partying constantly. Eventually, neither Kita or Marcus could take this kind of wild environment any longer. It got to a point where they were just both so bad that we just, we, we, had, we couldn't stay anymore. Something bad was about to happen and we didn't want to witness it. Kita and Marcus's hunch would turn out to be right on the money. What happened between Rebecca and Donald probably wasn't a huge surprise to the police either. After all, they had been called to the couple's house for various reasons a shocking 21 times. They knew that there had been domestic violence allegations. This was clearly a dysfunctional family, as investigator Justin Yentz explained. Normally, you don't see police going out and interacting with one specific home with that frequency. In one particular incident, when they arrived at the house, they noticed that Rebecca looked like she had been abused and had redness and swelling around her eyes. She was also mouthing the words, help me. When she found out that Donald had been arrested, she was terrified. She said they had no idea what they had done and that Donald was going to kill her. He's just going to kill me. Officer Jens could tell that Rebecca was in a panic. She became extremely terrified because she felt like DJ was going to be thrown into such a, a state of anger that he would kill her in the future. Donald claimed that anything Rebecca had said about him abusing her were lies, but video footage tells a different story. Jennifer Wilmot is Rebecca's attorney. She's well known for defending controversial women like Jodi Arias. Jennifer explained that almost all of Rebecca's abuse was caught on tape. This is because of the security cameras. There's surveillance in almost all the rooms of the house and outside. When we actually looked through hours and hours of tape. We actually found quite a few more incidents. In this incident, you can see Rebecca's head fly backwards after Donald slaps her viciously across the face. And then in this incident, Rebecca rubs a finger across Donald's computer screen, perhaps in a chance to get a rise out of him. As a result, Donald tugs her violently to the ground while her young son watches on. In yet another clip, Donald attacks Rebecca when she's not looking. He hits her in the back of the head before pouring water over her head. Some of Donald's attacks upon Rebecca are so incredibly severe that he could have hurt her really badly. It seemed as if he had very little regard for her life. One particularly bad attack took place outside and it was all captured on camera. In this clip taken in the middle of the day, Donald is out in the backyard and he's clearly angry as he tries to chase the family dog and ends up kicking a chair. A short time after, Rebecca can be seen walking out to the yard. Donald approaches her and grabs her by her shirt. He gets her to the ground and starts dragging her by her feet while she tries to get back up. He then tosses her into the pool as if she was nothing. He then came inside and locked the door so she couldn't get in. At this point in time, Donald's collection of weapons was astounding and disturbing. He certainly didn't always use them with caution, at times even putting Rebecca's life in danger. He would pull guns on her. He pretended to play Russian roulette one time with her. On one occasion, Donald caught Rebecca messing with one of his gun locks. As a result, he pushes her violently to the ground. Many of these incidents occurred in the span of just one week. We may never know about certain events that happened that weren't caught on film. There is one major thing that could have probably set Rebecca over the edge and caused her to make the decision to take Donald's life. He told her that he was going to hire someone to break into their house and stage it so that it looked like a robbery. She would be killed in the process. But those in Donald's defense denied that he ever threatened such things, and they said that the situation was actually the opposite. They claimed that Donald had wanted to leave Rebecca for a while, but was afraid about how she would respond. They said that this was the reason that there were security cameras all around the home. He knew somewhere in his head she was gonna hurt him. Strangely, Donald's daughter chose to defend her father's behavior and blame everything on Rebecca. She claimed that the violent scenes played out on video were simply depicting Donald's response to her purposefully bothering him. I know she antagonized him. I know she would do things to purposely hurt him and then get in his face and say, this is what I did. Did it hurt you? And what are you gonna do about it? Donald's ex-wife, Karen, seemed to believe a similar notion. She defended Donald saying that because he never abused her, it was impossible for her to believe that he hurt Rebecca. 
despite everything that was shown on video surveillance. I think people hear her version and they think, oh my God, well, good for her. Good for her for getting him. And it infuriates me. It infuriates me because it's not true. You're literally hearing one side of the story, which is being told by a pathological liar. He never, ever, ever raised a hand to me, much less his voice. Marcus and Kita, who were very close with both Donald and Rebecca before all this went down, were visually disturbed when they listened to the voicemail message of Donald's last few moments on Earth. You gotta be kidding me. While you can barely hear Rebecca's voice in the message before she shoots Donald, Marcus knew her well enough to notice that she didn't seem to be her usual drunk self. Her voice was different. She seemed very poisoned together. Usually her, when she has been drinking, she slurs, she doesn't make sense. And that was just clear as, as day. Kida, who is very emotional upon hearing this recording, made a very similar assessment. While the two may have been drinking, they didn't sound drunk. They both sound like not impaired to me. That, to me, that sounds not impaired, knowing them. While Rebecca, now in custody for her husband's murder, maintained that she didn't know what happened to Donald, Donald's family believes that he never stood a chance against her. Someone's gonna do something when they're blitzed out of their mind. Rebecca was charged with first degree murder and held in prison on a $1 million bail. She decided to move forward by going to trial. Had Rebecca gone to trial and lost, she would be facing the rest of her life in prison. She would never ever get out. She didn't want to risk it. In hopes of getting less prison time, she ends up taking a plea deal that comes along with a charge of second degree murder instead of first degree. Her lawyer believes that Rebecca never intentionally killed Donald. She believes this because of the casual way she shot him and because of how few times she shot him. Had she even known he was actually dead before calling 911? Probably not. Why would a woman who had been continually abused for years fire one shot that just grazes his head um, if she was truly intending to kill him. What would be the point of that? It would be much more likely for her to fire numerous shots to make sure she got him and then call 911 once she knew he was dead. Eventually, Rebecca would have to face a judge. Rebecca's testimony in court was that she was drinking on the night that Donald was killed and she doesn't remember the 23 minutes after shooting her husband when she failed to seek proper medical attention for him. The judge presiding over the case didn't really buy it and she certainly let Rebecca have it in court. I have a recollection of it. I watched it. I watched as you sat on the sofa, slowly smoking a cigarette patiently waiting as Mr. Mellon died. Even after taking the plea deal, Rebecca still got sentenced to 20 years behind bars. Donald's family did not feel this was enough time. It seems crazy to me. I mean, my dad's gone forever and she gets to kill someone and be free. Rebecca spent five years in prison with 15 left still to go when she agreed to a phone interview from behind bars. Rebecca, when you look at that videotape of you shooting your husband, mm -hmm. what do you think? I think it looks horrible and it's, it just sucks because it's like I don't I don't remember it happening. The reporter made a point to ask Rebecca about why she made the decision to smoke a cigarette after shooting her husband rather than calling 911 immediately. But you have the ability and the concentration to sit down and have a cigarette. And based mm -hmm. on the video, it appeared like you were watching. Yeah, I didn't even, I didn't remember even smoking or any of that. And I didn't come back into focus until I saw him um, on the couch. Rebecca was brutally abused at the hands of her husband, something there's much proof of. It wouldn't have seemed entirely crazy for her to want to fight him back, something the reporter pointed out. Rebecca, anyone who endured what we saw you endure in those videos, how could you not want to hurt him back for the way he treated you? I mean, that, that to me almost sounds logical. It's, I mean, it. it's just not the type of person I am. I've never been like that, and I've never done anything to hurt anybody. And, 
You know, I had like never even been in a fight or anything like that. I'm, I'm not that type of person. Rebecca also pointed out that Donald had threatened to have her killed by staging a robbery. It was only a matter of a phone call. When the gunshot went off, it was everything went blurry and it, I didn't mean for it to go off, you know. I just was trying to plead my case before he made, you know, this phone call that was supposed to be um, the hitman coming. Unmasking a killer who ghoulishly had hidden the body of one of his victims in a cooler he used to deliver homemade granola bars to his customers. This is the case of Kania Mung. Kania Mung, a stunning 19-year-old college student, went missing off the streets of Colorado on April 1st, April Fool's Day. Kania's stepfather actually thought that his wife was messing with him when she told him that Kania was missing. Kania was well-loved by her stepfather Tony and mother Maria, and she loved caring for their young children. She had high hopes of going to college and pursuing a degree in broadcasting. But everything would change one night when Kania went out with her friends to drink at a nightclub despite being underage. I had no idea about this party life that she had. Not only had Kania gotten a fake ID so that she could go to bars with her friends, but she ended up getting so drunk that she was kicked out of a club and sent out alone onto the empty streets of Denver. She was scantily clothed and didn't have her purse or even her phone. But something about this story isn't adding up. According to Kania's friends, she hadn't had a lot to drink that night. In fact, she had drunk just as much as the rest of her friends, and they still felt well in control of themselves. So maybe someone did slip a in her drink. That is what we believe. What's even worse was that Kania happened to be kicked out of the bar alongside another man who was caught doing inappropriate things on the dance floor. Not wanting to wait for the police to start their investigation, Tony got Kania's phone from her friends and began combing through it. He was quickly disturbed by one of the recent messages that read, Hey, this is Travis, the guy who just gave you a ride last night, white, creepy van. Did you get your car home okay? As Tony further looks into Travis, he comes across footage of him and Kania leaving the bar together. Travis tried to get Kania to come inside his loft with him, but she denies, wanting to just get back to her friends. Just minutes after, she could be seen chatting with a homeless man outside the building. Tony ends up getting into contact with Travis, the man who he believes was the last person to see his daughter, and they arrange to meet up at a gas station, the same gas station that Travis claims he took Kania to on the night of her disappearance, only for her to wander off with some random guy. What Tony hadn't expected was that his wife, fearing for his own safety, arranged for cops to meet him at the gas station to prevent an altercation. Travis is brought in for questioning before Tony can even talk to him. I mean, and if I had felt any sort of any sort of weirdness about her walking over that guy, I wouldn't have I would have done something. After that, a massive search ensued for the man that Kania had allegedly walked off with that night. Not long after this search began, did Travis himself disappear. Police chose to look further into his place of work, which included the factory where he made granola bars. It was on the same film that they found him wheeling a body into a cooler. Unfortunately, because of the heavy amounts of bleach he used, it was impossible for them to identify Kania's remains. While Travis had disappeared, he can't evade the police for long. He ends up getting arrested for driving a vehicle that was reportedly stolen. Not long after his attack upon Kania, is it determined that he tried to kill another woman, Lydia Tillman? Travis beat Lydia horrifically, then believing her to be dead, doused her body in gasoline in hopes of burning her remains. Miraculously, she managed to survive by jumping out a window. Because she was so badly wounded, she could not explain to the police what had happened to her. They ended up having to use DNA found under her nails to identify her attacker. They quickly determined it to be Travis, just as they suspected. He was arrested for a slew of charges, including assault and murder. Travis eventually decides to admit to everything he did to Kania in order to avoid the death penalty. I killed her. I did not mean to kill her. Travis was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Still, this case took such a toll on Kania's parents that they ultimately decided to split up and grieve their separate ways.
This is the story of Christina Morris, a young woman who left her family heartbroken when she disappeared out of thin air. Her disappearance haunted her heartbroken family for years. What you're seeing here is the last image of a young woman named Christina Morris alive. She's seen on the surveillance footage walking through the streets at night with her friend Enrique Orochi. They were heading towards a dark parking garage. This beautiful girl from Texas would never make it out alive. These two individuals, Christina and Enrique, first met in high school and their friendship would result in Christina's death. On the night of Christina's disappearance, they had been drinking near a local shopping center. Enrique was loaded up on rum and beer. He was angry because he had made sexual advances towards a girl and was rejected by her. Christina thought that when she left the bar that night with Enrique, that she was leaving with a friend. Little did she know that she was leaving with someone who was desperate to take his anger out on someone else. When Christina failed to get into contact with her family, she was declared a missing person and a massive search ensued. It was not long before Enrique became police's number one suspect, not only because he was the last person seen with her, but because when they searched his car, they found Christina's DNA in his trunk. He denied having anything to do with Christina's disappearance. I have nothing to do with the disappearance of Christina Morris. I don't know anything about the disappearance of Christina Morris. Eventually, police had enough evidence that they were able to arrest Enrique and charge him with aggravated kidnapping. He pleaded not guilty. Christina's family were desperate for Enrique to provide any information possible that would help them bring Christina home. I'm so torn up right now. I want answers. Mm -hmm and I think that he needs to give us his answers that he's put us through enough. Police believe that Enrique kidnapped Christina by stuffing her into the trunk of his car and he killed her later. He then hid the evidence of the murder in trash cans around town and carefully cleaned his vehicle. An excavation team cleaning an area for a new housing subdivision would later find Christina's remains and notify the police. The trial was long. It took two years for justice to finally be served. They're confident they've got the right guy. Enrique Rochi. Any possibility that it's anybody else just simply isn't there. The jury deliberated for 17 hours before making their decision. On judgment day, the courtroom was filled with Christina's family and friends anxiously awaiting the verdict. Because this is such an emotional, horrific case, the judge warned all present that he would allow an audible reaction to the verdict, whether positive or negative. If you can't sit in this courtroom without reacting, this would be a good time to leave. These people did not ask for this job. And they have been working very, very long. And their verdict will be respected. And you will not disrupt this room. Then came the news that everyone was waiting for. Verdict form reads as follows. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of aggravated kidnapping as charged in the indictment. Enrique would then be sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole. Christina's family were very relieved by the verdict and her mother could be seen pumping her fist while leaving the courthouse. The decision would not bring back Christina, but it would mean that Enrique would spend the rest of his life behind bars and never be able to hurt another innocent person again. We can breathe. I feel like the right thing happened. Do you think Enrique's sentence was fair? Let us know in the comments.